I'm going to show you a locked cupboard, which is truly amazing. I'm in Darmstadt in Germany at the Helmholtz GSI, the institute where they make super heavy elements. And with me is Bettina, who's head of the target lab, where they make the key component in the experiments where the elements are synthesized. And she's going to show me this exciting cupboard. So before you see the cupboard, though actually it was drawers, let me explain a bit of background so you really appreciate what I saw. We were at the institute where they synthesize these really exotic elements by accelerating relatively light atoms, calcium, titanium, and slamming those accelerated atoms into a target, usually of a metal. That target is often made of a very special material, often just one isotope from an element that has lots of different isotopes. And the lab that we were seeing was the one where they prepared those targets. It's not just having a lump of the metal, but the metal has to be made into a very thin foil so that atoms can go through it and come out the other side. Otherwise, you might synthesize something exotic, but you'd never see it. So you can imagine there's this huge institute with scientists working here and others coming to visit for experiments and they all want different targets. They all want their special isotope, and they want it now. So Bettina and her crew have to keep a big selection so they've got the right thing without having to wait to order it or even to have it made. So it's a really extraordinary, if not unique, place on this planet where you can see such a selection of different isotopes. Come in. Thank you. So, we have a huge variety of materials in all these drawers, like standard materials like copper, aluminium, in, as a foil, as an ingot, scandium, silicon. The locked cupboards are the enriched materials. So the enriched isotopes, they are behind. And um, so we can open something, for example, gadolinium if they want 152 or 155 or 157. So all these rare earth materials can be deposited on a backing and then they run in the beam. For example, for this beam time we made 142 neodymium. And you can buy the neodymium in different forms. And we typically buy this as the oxide, but we need the fluoride because the oxide cannot be deposited. So you buy this and then you convert the, fluoride in, the oxide into the fluoride. This is neodymium-142 as a fluoride. It's not so spectacular. We have to pack them out before, maybe. I don't know. Well, let's pick some good ones. Let's pick some ones that are going to look more pretty. Although the targets are all made of metals, or nearly all of them, many of the samples were oxides, because the oxides are more stable. They're a bit disappointing to look at. I get quite excited, but... There's a limit even how excited I can get compared to looking at some of the metals. So here, we have example, we have targets which can stay on air. For example, tin. This is 120 tin, so this is the metal. And this is um, about 20 to 40 um, nanometer thick. So this is very thin, and this can be applied as a target in the beam. For the super heavy elements, they only use these small targets as tests. For the real experiments, for the real run, they have this banana shaped. And are these very expensive, these isotopes? These, for example. This is so expensive, no one can pay for this because it's not produced anymore. So ruthenium, the material which can be produced still, the price is between one euro or up to what, 300 euros per milligram. This is, for example, this is cadmium. Yeah. I don't open this because cadmium is very unhealthy. This is why it's blocked. For example, this is molybdenum. This could open this. You see, can you see this here? Yeah. 
This is 92 molybdenum, and this is uh, 450 micrograms, so it's about half a micrometer. So this is a very, very uh, high melting metal. This is 30 silicon, but this is the oxide. We cannot produce this as a metal, so you see this is grey, this is not really shiny. You and the team spend all your days and nights here making these targets, like lovingly crafting them, being very delicate, and then they take them over and they get blasted with a beam and get destroyed. Does that make you happy or does that make you sad when they get blasted to pieces and end their life? Or does that make you feel proud? If they destroy them in the purpose, what they should do, then this is fine. If they don't handle them carefully until they are set in the beam, we sometimes are a bit annoyed. You see, when they come and want something very, very thin, the thinnest you can, and you discuss what is the purpose, and then you make something very thin, self-supporting, and they go through the door and break all of them. That happens sometimes. Yes, sometimes this happens, and then this is, then we are a bit annoyed. Or if you produce something very, very carefully, and then they want to make sure that they know where the middle point is and then take a pen and scratch in this perfectly polished surface. Yes, then we are a bit annoyed and we make fun of them. So we talk about it. But in principle, like for, you see plasma physics, for example, there's a huge, huge part department here as well. One shot, one target. They get hundreds of targets. But that's the purpose. It's a good customer. We prepare perfect targets and then they destroy all of them. While for the super heavy elements, they get always either four for the Tasca or eight in this wheel, and they run over the wheel, and they can run with a wheel one, seven, eight, ten days. So we then we produce a little theory, like for three wheels or for two wheels, and yes, at the end of the beam time, you can see that they lost material, the material is gone, but this is the purpose, what, what they're meant for, so this is fine. If they are not destroyed, because they are stupid or don't understand how precious it is, then it's fine. And this is gold, and these are some of the experiments, and this is beryllium. I want to see gold. Gold's the best. Yeah. Gold is a monoisotope. What was really surprising is that Bettina seemed rather bored by gold. You know, you show Brady a bit of gold, and he gets really excited. I just want to see some gold. Yes, you can see gold. You see? Oh, hang on. This yeah. is gold. Can, can we it, take that out or is yeah, it not? Sure, okay. can take I want to see the shine. So it's not a big challenge. Has to be done for some of their experiments. Beautiful. But it's not something that tests their skill. So they have, for different thicknesses, they have different targets. They're like medals, aren't they? They're like it's prizes. Perhaps quite an interesting sample was an isotope of mercury. I think it was Mercury 202. I didn't even know that Mercury had different isotopes. And what made it special is it was the only sample that was a liquid. There wasn't very much of it, but there was enough for Brady to photograph. So one thing we were never told was precisely where they got the isotopes from. Perhaps that's a secret. They didn't want Brady or me going out and buying their isotopes and perhaps putting up the price. So I can't tell you where any of them came from. Brady asked Bettina what was the most exciting, most expensive isotope they had. Platinum 198. Yeah, but we have to take it out to show you. Okay. You want to, want to see it? Yeah, go on, if, if it's expensive. <laughs> the reason why 198 Platinum is so special is that nobody makes it at the moment so you can't buy it. This is around one and a half milligram per square centimeter, so this okay. is fairly thin. They bought a sample in the early 2000s, but nobody can get it, and so they guard their samples really carefully. Some of these films of metals they've got are really very thin. You can make some of the films by rolling the metal, squeezing it between rollers, and it just gets thinner and thinner, rather like you can squeeze out pastry or something like that when you're cooking. But to get really thin films, they often deposit the metal on top of another metal, for example, molybdenum on top of copper, and then they dissolve off the copper and you're left with this very thin sample of molybdenum. It has to be said that 
most metals are shiny silvery metals and one metal does look a bit like another though you could feel the excitement and passion when she admired all her different samples but you have to be a real connoisseur well we're connoisseurs we're periodic videos yes in this box we keep all the materials either natural or enriched which cannot survive under air or under humid air it was a bit difficult to see in detail inside, especially with my bifocals. Now, the big question is, what do they do with these metals? They have to take these metals and put them on some sort of support. And their targets are often mounted in a wheel. And the bits of the wheel that contain the targets are shaped a bit like a banana. They were really quite excited to show us how they made these bananas. They call them bananas themselves, it's not my imagination. And they were hoping that I'd try my hand at doing it. But once they saw how much they shook, they thought perhaps they'd do it themselves. And we saw two demonstrations. One was putting films of carbon onto the banana and the other was putting on films of gold. But the method is broadly the same. These very thin films can float on the surface of water. They then dip a banana in a frame into the water and slowly draw it out. She draws it out without touching anything and it has to have a very smooth and no wrinkles. Lovely, that is a skill, that is. And then you cut round it with a scalpel and you've got your sample. Eight carbon backhands will be on a, wheel, on a ship wheel. And uh, at GSR we can produce the carbon as large and as thin, thin and as homogeneous as nowhere else. So this is something which we are really good at. I was particularly impressed by the technician who the others call Queen of Carbon, who managed to do the thing miraculously quickly. And once they've got these films, either of gold or of carbon, they can evaporate the isotope they want onto the film. They have special vacuum evaporators where the material to be coated, that's, that's going to form the film, is in a little crucible which is heated up and the target sits above and rotates. Brady peered in a little window and after he'd got rid of his own reflection he could see the coating taking place. One problem is that some metals have rather low melting points, particularly lead, and the target gets pretty hot because of all the energy that's been dumped into it and the lead tends to melt and run down. So they have got round this by using lead sulphide, which has a much higher melting point and therefore gives a much more stable target. And since you're only interested in the reaction of the individual atoms, the fact that it's in a compound rather than metallic lead doesn't really matter. Making the lead sulphide is really quite simple chemistry. They showed it to us and it was really quite fun. It was the only bit of chemistry that was easy to understand. They dissolve up the lead in nitric acid and it makes a completely clear solution of lead nitrate. And then they add ammonium sulphide and the ammonium sulphide causes the lead sulphide to precipitate. And there's really nice watching this black precipitate. And then at the end, they filter out the lead sulphide. But you've got to remember that when they do this, it's not just any lead, but it's really quite precious lead with a particular isotope. In this case, lead 208. And that does have a price. 
is about one euro per milligram. So that's thousand euros per gram. Visiting the target lab was really exciting. But of course, that's only half the story because we wanted to see where they were making the beams. How did the beams form? How did the ions get into the accelerator? And so on. And we were lucky enough to be shown that as well. So soon you'll see a video, what happens at the other end of the process. Keep watching. More and more. And eventually, after days perhaps, they stick together and you make a big atom. The beam is coming from here, from the accelerator, which you have just seen. Along the tube. Along the tube here. 